This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. In this episode, I welcome on an old friend of the podcast, Dr. Lara Bryden, a naturopathic physician based in New Zealand who is a world-renowned expert on hormone health and endocrine-related hormone concerns. You can find her at www.larabryden.com. Dr. Bryden was on episode number nine, speaking on endometriosis, and on episode 38, speaking on androgen dominance. And she comes back on this episode to speak about female hormones after 40, which is the subject of her latest book, The Hormone Repair Manual, Every Woman's Guide to Hormones After 40. It's available on Amazon and other retailers. Dr. Bryden is a expert she is on the member of the Scientific Advisory Council for the Center for Menstrual Cycle and Ovulation Research at the University of British Columbia, among other accolades. In this episode, we drive deeply into female hormones after 40, which Dr. Brighton calls the second puberty. We discuss cultural and anthrop- anthropologic aspects of perimenopause and menopause. We discuss the four phases of perimenopause and how, in some women, it may start earlier than is traditionally thought. We have a deep discussion on progesterone, testosterone, estradiol, and discuss some of the concerns of treatment and how some women may need extra support, especially when it comes to the role of hormones in brain health, metabolic health, and cardiovascular disease. We discuss specifically which women are most likely to benefit from support during this phase of life. As is a tradition on the One Thing Podcast, we dedicate each episode to a nonprofit charity. This episode is devoted to Vitamin Angels, who supports providing nutri- nutritional supplements to underserved populations. The first 100 plays of this podcast will be given a donation in its honor to this charity. We will donate $100 total to the vitamin angels as part of dr bryden's appearance on the episode thanks again for tuning into the one thing podcast dr bryden welcome back to the one thing podcast it's great to have you back on with us today hi adam thanks for having me again yes yeah um i'd love to jump into hearing kind of some updates from you um since we left off you were last on and we talked about androgen dominance. Yes. And I know you've been up to a lot of things since then. So I, I just love to, to hear kind of an update on your life. Oh, sure. So that was I just checked the dates. That was, I don't know when we recorded it, but it came out middle of last year. So that was during the pandemic, I guess, or yes. already into the pandemic. <laughs> so <laughs> since then, I have managed to travel to Canada. And if your listeners remember, but I, I'm Canadian, Canadian trained ND, but I live in Christchurch, New Zealand. And I did get back to Canada for a few months to visit family, which was not easy. Pandemic international travel is, uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's hard. Yeah. So, but now I'm back in New Zealand for New Zealand summer. Great. Yeah. And something else big happened between now and then. Right? Oh, yeah. So. And I've really, of course, I yeah. released my new book, Hormone Repair Manual, which is a sequel to my first book, Period Repair Manual, and it's for women over 40. So I'd probably say over 35. It's about Hormone Repair Manual. Every Woman's Guide to Healthy Hormones After 40 is about the process of second puberty or perimenopause, which can start as young as 35, all the way through to menopause, which is actually when periods end, and then beyond, of course, into the menopausal periods. Yeah. yeah, I've always appreciated how you've kind of weaved your own life experiences within your books, especially yeah. like, you know, being 
the mother of your stepdaughter and things yeah. she's gone through and then your own experiences yeah. and and now you're in a different chapter of your life. Um, I just maybe yeah. share a little bit of that. Sure. Yeah, I shared actually in this book, the second book, I did share a little bit more about my personal life than I did in the first one. As you say, like I think the mention of my stepdaughter was one of the only things I did in the first one. But in this one, I mentioned that the fact that I'm menopausal myself or nearly when I in January I think I will graduate to menopause or achieve menopause which should be 12 months before my or sorry after my final period unless I get another one and I do talk a little bit about just some of you know the mild some of the symptoms I've had and just also some of this I talk a little bit about um in chapter two what I call the return to girlhood this kind of cheeky sense of just wanting to shirk duties and be less of a people pleaser which is it seems to be pretty universal across cultures which is interesting and Mm. certainly I had heard that from my patients you know decades ago when I was treating them and I was in my 30s and they were kind of talking about this and I think as a young woman you don't quite believe it until you get there and then it's like oh it's like this is what this is what it is so there's a there can be a feeling of just not giving a shit anymore about certain things. <laughs> Sorry, pardon my yeah, French, but yeah. it's um, can be quite refreshing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds so. liberating. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read that part in your book, and I was yeah. thinking yeah. that's I've heard it described in different ways, but I love yeah. the the term cheeky because yeah, yeah, that, that encapsulates the yeah. whole the whole vibe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So well. Um, the interesting thing, you know, I think that looking at this topic is sort of, there's, as you point out a very individual experience Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think from a marketing standpoint, like industry would like promote that hormones after 40 is something that might be someone should dread. Or right. it's this awful experience or watch out, you right. better be ready for it. Um, I think your your book sheds some cultural and personal perspectives yeah. that's much more holistic and global. And maybe we could start there with just kind of setting a framework for discussion sure. today. Because we I titled the this talk, you know, is a um just hormones after 40 is just kind of like the subtitle of your book, but um Maybe we can start with just some cultural perspectives. Yeah. And... I, I want to start with a, through the lens of evolutionary biology, yes. if that's all right, because yep. that's my first career. I may have mentioned I that in previous that. Yeah. interviews. I, I was an evolutionary biologist before I trained as a naturopathic doctor. So I do see a lot of things through that lens. And so there has been this narrative that modern in modern day we women outlive our ovaries and therefore menopause is kind of an unnatural state which is a state of estrogen deficiency which should be medicalized and treated with estrogen now first of all I'll just say i don't i'm not against taking estrogen so that's just get that we can talk we can circle back to that so yeah. without you know acknowledging that estrogen therapy can be helpful and all of those things but still debunking the idea that menopause is estrogen deficiency because from an evolutionary perspective that is incorrect and basically there's a there's another book which i mention in my book and which has influenced me quite strongly called the slow moon climbs by historian yep. susan batron i've plugged her book like probably 50 <laughs> times so she hopefully that's helping her sales but she takes a deep dive into um the grandmother hypothesis and basically builds the argument through several lines of evidence that it's possible that a longer human lifespan, so a longer lifespan for Homo sapiens in general, which includes both men and women, evolved because of beneficial selection pressure on women post-reproduction. Mm. So in other words, it, it might be the case that ovaries can only keep going for 45 years. You know, that's sort of maybe they do have a sort of a expiry, expiry date, if you will, or like, you know, maybe, or for whatever reason we are programmed, it's maybe hardwired that we can't make babies past 45, but 45 or 50. But um, this is pretty clear that even in ancient societies, people did live to 70 or 80, not the majority, because many were people were dying of infection and injury. And so the average life expectancy was lower 
-hmm. but the lifespan, the biological lifespan of what a human could achieve reach if they, he or she were lucky enough to escape all of those common hazards was, has, has for a long time been 70 or 80. In fact, maybe for like hundreds of thousands of years, potentially, obviously we don't have historical records going back that far, but we do have, um, modern day, the few modern day, um, hunter gatherer people like the Hadza, they go through menopause. And interestingly, and we could talk about this, they do not report on average symptoms associated with the transition for like, they're generally happy about it. Like it's like, and they do talk about that return to girlhood or this, you know, you stop having babies at 45, 50, and then you do other stuff, right? Like then you, yeah. you've still, and also we know from the research on the Hadza that women in their fifties and sixties, and maybe even into their seventies are very productive for the group. Like they actually, the statistic is, and I provide some of this, a little bit of discussion about this in hormone repair manual. They, women in their fifties and sixties gather more food per like per individual than any other demographic. So they're Mm. like providing more food for the group than young people or even than Mm. older men. So I just feel like, for, and we won't spend too much time on this, but like this whole argument that older women were very important for survival of their descendants and that that's why they were so, this was selected for this post-reproductive lifespan. And so mm-hmm. from that perspective, it's not a disease state, right? Like how could it be? It can't be a, a natural thing that we do and that was selected for it and at the same time be a disease state. Right. So, yeah. So from that, and so then there is also this whole other layer of that, which is that there, it may be a classic case of what's called evolutionary mismatch, this sort of, this natural transition to post-reproductive. It, when that um, intersects with our modern environment, we potentially do get this whole set of symptoms that our ancestors don't get and that the Hadza don't get, for example. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh also, I think I like how, you know, for a lot of women, you point out who, you know, didn't have their own children or what have you, or have been sort of asked, you know, are you going to have more children? Or, you know, there was all this pressure to, you know, sort of have children or, or choose, choose that path that that stage can also be very liberating when, you know, the, the things have just moved on from there. True. You, you stop being asked about whether you're going to have kids or not. Like you're no longer, when, when society looks at you, you're no longer, are you making babies? The question isn't, oh, are you making babies or why or why not? It's like, oh, you're a different, you have a different role in society now. You're, And we all know, actually, just intuitively, that makes sense, right? Like we all personally know women's in their, women in their 50s and 60s who are getting stuff done right like seriously yeah. getting stuff done <laughs> like yeah. in politics or in you know business or even just in a personal sphere it's it can be a very productive time and yeah, so women get really, to just be seen for who they are yeah i really love hearing that i think it's yeah. so important um and you know maybe we could segue into just talking about the outline of the four different phases of sure the menopausal transition um, or just kind of uh, hormone changes. And that would be really good to just kind of set that framework. Sure. So these are, some of these come from the the Swan study, women across the nation, um, you know, a decade or so ago, but then modified by Professor Geraldine Pryor, who's a reproductive endocrinologist, a scientist in Canada at, at University of British Columbia at the, Center for Menstruation and Ovulation Research, KIBCOR, of which I'm on her scientific advisory board. Mm. And um, so she sort of modified, she added another phase. So I'll talk about, the, she added this phase called, which she called very early perimenopause, which is, nor, it's, a, it's a normal phase of a normal perimenopause, but it basically what it is, it's, it's the phase when symptoms arise, but periods are still regular and that's recently been backed up by a a new study that just came out confirming that does happen for some women not all women I also want to say at the beginning that like at this point that not everyone experiences symptoms only about so if you have out of four women one in four experience no symptoms at all just cruise through with no dramas two out of four will experience some mild symptoms and one out of four will experience symptoms enough to seek medical help for it. So that just kind of gives a, um, 
a lay of the land. But in terms of the four phases, so using Professor Pryor's framework, which is what I put in my book, um, very early perimenopause. And again, just to differentiate that from early menopause, which is a whole other thing. I'm talking about a normal perimenopause, menopause transition, mm -hmm. which can normally start at 30, as young as 35, and mm -hmm. which is different than, say, period stopping at 30, which is early menopause, which is another topic, which I do talk about early menopause in the book, but I think we'll leave that to one side for now. So for the normal transition phase, um, phase one is when symptoms start, periods are still regular. And so symptoms, there's a list of nine symptoms, most of the majority of which are neurological. So that would include hot flashes, night sweats, increased frequency of migraines or new onset of migraines. Um, sleep disturbance is a really classic one. In reduced ability to cope with stress overall, and we can talk about physiologically why that happens. Increased risk of anxiety and depression, which is documented in the scientific literature, and that also is documented that reverts to normal, like reverts, reverts back to baseline with achieving or graduating to menopause. So it really is this window of time of recalibration, as I discuss in the book, that women are vulnerable to symptoms, but it's not how you're always going to be. And this is one of my key messages too. Like if you're having more migraines and feeling more anxious and not sleeping, and for, the other thing is cognition. So forgetting things, it's not how you're always going to be. This is, you know, it, in a healthy state, this would be just a temporary set of symptoms. And then some of the other symptoms are around menstruation. So heavy, much like sometimes extremely heavy bleeding, unfortunately, um, more period pain, breast pain. And then the ninth symptom, I might've missed some in there, but the, the ninth one is metabolic change. So weight gain around the middle, which we, if we have time, we can get to today. And there, a lot of them are obviously interrelated. They're all caused by some of the same underlying processes. So sticking with our four phases, that's phase one, symptoms yeah. arise, periods still regular. Phase two then is about when there starts to be some variation in the cycle length by more than seven days, counting from day one to day one of the next. And we're talking now ovulatory natural cycles. So obviously anyone right. on the pill, on the, being on the pill negates all of this. Yes. And then, um, then phase three is when there's a lot more variation between cycles, like you might start going 60 days or more between periods. That, and each of these phases can go on for a couple of years. And then phase four is where I am personally. I call it the waiting room. So you've had what you suspect. You wonder if it might be your last period. And then you're waiting 12 months to see if that was the last period. And typically that phase goes on for a few years too, because you'll wait six months. It's like, oh, there's another period. And yeah. then you, have, and then you yeah. have to reset and start all over again. Mm -hmm. And so most, if they're, if they're going to be symptoms with, menopause per se. I mean, I use the word menopause in quotes because it, this whole, what I'm describing is actually called perimenopause yeah. versus menopause, according to Professor Pryor's definition is actually menopause is the life phase that begins one year after the final period. So menopause right. is after phase four, but if they're going to be symptoms, most of them are during these perimenopausal years. And that once you're a few years into menopause properly, there are relatively few symptoms, although there can still obviously be things like vaginal dryness or the genital urinary syndrome of yeah. menopause, which we can, I don't know if we'll touch on today because there's so much to talk about in the perimenopause <laughs> transition. There yeah. is. And your, yeah. your book is just loaded with all this information too. So it's yeah. whatever we don't cover. There's a lot <laughs> yeah. more to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, what's really interesting is just to kind of jump back to the first phase. I think um, that is not talked about quite a bit as like a bridge into this world of, of um, perimenopause. I, I yeah. think, you know, most people, the first mention of perimenopause is well into the 40s, you know, like early 40s is usually what's traditionally mentioned. But it's, it's interesting, like you put out, you put out the kind of clear message that this should be a change in your usual pattern. Like, yeah. If you have, you know, since age 13 or so, have a typical pattern where there's, you know, you're following a menstrual cycle pattern and then you get to this point in your life and then you start to see these changes, that's when that awareness well, it, is so key. 
Sure. And keep in mind, phase one actually cycles could still be completely regular. So, and that's where, I guess it's something to mention here is that's where part of that diagnostic algorithm is obviously to exclude other causes. So it's not like anyone who, any person in the early, any woman in her early forties who gets night sweats, it's not guaranteed to be perimenopause. It could be, sure. it could be thyroid going on. I talk about thyroid disease in the book and there's a strong kind of intersection between thyroid and perimenopause. And then obviously there could be something more sinister going on. So it's about, it's kind of, it's a, a what, like many things, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So if other explanations for those symptoms have been ruled out and you're left with a midlife and well, I know it's kind of shocking to think 35 is midlife, but yeah. <laughs> and then you know, if you're left with, you know, someone, a woman having symptoms, midlife woman having symptoms and other causes have been ruled out, then that's perimenopause. And there's no blood test for perimenopause. This, and there's no urine test for perimenopause. It's, it's, the assessment is done by context and by ruling out other explanations. Obviously. And right. just to say again, there is a blood test for early menopause. We'll just kind of leave that. But like, it, so the blood test FSH, as you know, FSH does go very high af with menopause, but during perimenopause, it's bouncing all over the place. It can be quite low. And so that can make it frustrating and see what happens is, and why this, I hope my book is being, is helpful to women is because women it can, it's so easy to feel like, okay, I'm just going crazy. Like, I don't know what is going on. I used to be, I'll hear like, I used to be such a good sleeper and now I just can't sleep and I don't mm -hmm. understand what has happened to me. And if you don't know what's going on, then you can definitely be left thinking, this is how I'm always going to be now. And I give in chapter one, I give the example of fibromyalgia. The onset of fibromyalgia can essentially be a, fib a perimenopause symptom, not, not in every case, obviously, because other people get fibromyalgia too. But it's, you know, it's sort of, it's important to understand if, it, if this is temporary and not, you know, not a permanent diagnosis and it's just worth mentioning too like obviously these are as you said new symptoms so if someone has had a lifelong history of mental health and depression you know it may worsen in their 40s but it's not caused by perimenopause it's still like an underlying issue so I hope sure that's, hope that's clear yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. i think it's uh during those those early kind of changes you know the first hormone of consideration that usually comes up in the conversation of that's changing is progesterone. Um, yeah. It's often talked about, you know, just to sort of like to, to pay attention to. And I know Dr. Pryor has been really um, a pioneer in understanding progesterone and yeah. understanding the use of progesterone. Maybe we could go into a a, like a deep dive into talking about progesterone. I know you write about it a lot. Yeah. And I've had, you know, with well, the majority of my patients, it's, it's something that um, therapeutic use of progesterone is generally a positive, but there's, there's always like some variables that pop up from now and then. And okay. I'd love to kind of just maybe do like a deeper dive into progesterone sure. as a hormone, like what it is and uh, kind of go through some okay. discussion. Yeah. So, Progesterone is the hormone we make after ovulation. Um, it's a partner to estrogen. It, we make it after ovulation in every cycle. And obviously then during pregnancy, we make astronomical amounts of progesterone, which is why actually postpartum is largely kind of a progesterone withdrawal state. Um, and it's generally in most women, progesterone is anxiolytic or calming and like anxiety reducing improving mood in that way it's quite kind of tranquilizing they say and that's why generally there's can be kind of a, a more chilled kind of sleepy feeling in the early luteal phase and but then on the other side of that in the in the few days premenstrually there's a progesterone withdrawal um which is part of premenstrual mood symptoms sometimes so just to put it in context and um, of course, there's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. I do always need to mention that just to clarify, because progestins are very different and progestins are not calming like progesterone because no progestin converts to the neurosteroid 
allopregnolone that progesterone does, mm. right? So progesterone has this profound effect on the brain, largely beneficial that proge no progestins have. And in fact, being on hormonal birth control suppresses ovulation, so robs the brain of progesterone. And one thing I'll just mention, because I think it was something you said in your question, but there is a minority of women, about one in 20, who do not experience progesterone as tranquilizing. They have a paradoxical reaction. I think it's a lot to do with their GABA receptor in their brain. So we can talk about that. And that can make it tricky for treatment. So these are women who, I see them in my comments on like, in my blog, and they're like, they're like, this is completely wrong. Like, you know, what you're saying about progesterone being calming is completely wrong because for me, it made me crazy. It's like, yeah, that's, you, you would feel that way if you're the one in 20. You're like, what is everybody else talking about? That is insane. So yeah. there's, we could, that said progesterone, I guess, sensitivity, if you will. There's, there's definitely some individuality in that. But just kind of zooming out a bit, I just feel like I want to talk about this. So with perimenopause, it, it, I would argue it is, as you've just said, and what I say, say in my book is that especially the very early phase of a normal perimenopause is largely the result of losing progesterone or a lower dose of progesterone, a lower amount of progesterone because of shorter luteal phases and a shift to an ovulatory cycles. And that's in large part what kind of destabilizes mood and the stress response and makes periods heavier because progesterone is a period lightening. Yeah. lightening hormone but weirdly like and this is where professor Pryor's work comes in like as you said she's been a pioneer but she's also been kind of a standalone like she is like she is not the majority of experts unfortunately this like attention on progesterone is has not been happening and progesterone is largely like the cinderella hormone is just like the forgotten hormone like yeah. it just doesn't it hasn't been historically talked about i'd say conventionally there's very little discussion of progesterone the role of progesterone or its absence in perimenopause is not acknowledged mm. hardly at all so this is where the, this is part of the sort of I guess there, this is one area in medicine where there is has been traditionally kind of a separation between, on the one hand, naturopathic doctors and natural health practitioners and Gerilyn Pryor, even though she's not a natural health practitioner, but, you know, sort of in this camp of saying, wait, let's look at progesterone. And actually progesterone is giving it is often very helpful for um, lightening periods and improving mood and promoting sleep and reducing migraines and all these things it can do clinically. And then on the other hand, conventionally, they're like, what are you talking about? You know, progesterone is bad for mood. And when the conventional narrative that progesterone is bad for mood, this sounds weird, but this is actually what's happened. They are talking about progestins because there's been this like confusion in the research. Like it's a little crazy when you think about it, like literally for decades, a lot of the doctors and even scientists not differentiating between progesterone, which forms a calming tranquilizing neurosteroid and progestins, which generally have an anxiety promoting effect on the brain. So yeah. kind of melding those two, then the narrative is, well, progesterone causes anxiety. So, and then, so they really, from the conventional perspective, the, a lot of the symptoms of perimenopause are attributed to estrogen going lower, which is actually not what's happening in the earliest phases of perimenopause it does eventually go lower of course but in the early phases it's estrogen is up to three times higher so this is where i hope my book is will succeed at yeah. trying to shift this conversation a little bit and bring progesterone into the conversation yeah i mean i think it's it's really shaped my practice um for sure especially understanding how progestions um, actually, I think in your first book, you talk about how they actually have almost like a testosterone like effect in some women. Yeah. Or, um, yeah. yeah, I guess that's that uh, anxiety effect. Well, actually, testosterone doesn't have testosterone actually reduces anxiety, which is well, I was um, yeah, but, but the progestins. It, yeah, progestins. It is, you're right. Absolutely spot on. Like, I think we talk about progestins in our androgen episode last year, but some, depending on the type or what they call generation or which group of progestins, some of them are 
androgenic, um, they, and for that reason, they can impair insulin sensitivity and cause weight gain. Progesterone itself is anti-androgen. In fact, the other thing that's happened since our last conversation is Professor Pryor and I published a scientific paper about progesterone, cyclic progesterone therapy for PCOS, talking, and we're talking about real progesterone now, and its benefits for um, reducing androgens and improving PCOS potentially. And also there is an androgen kind of dominance component of menopause as well, that if for women who do end up taking estrogen and hopefully progesterone as well, the natural progesterone, um, can that can help maintain healthy metabolism in part by counteracting androgens. So we can yeah. go into yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. So that, that'll be interesting to yeah. get into testosterone a little bit because yeah. um, I think you, you really talk about that well in this book about also the metabolic shifts that can happen in perimenopause yeah. um, as it relates to testosterone. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, I guess the form of progesterone is always debated back and forth and in some circles we'll say that, um, to have, if you're taking bioidentical progesterone and it, you want it to be central acting, meaning work on GABA and yep. cal- CNS calming, then it needs to be sort of an oral capsule yep. versus like a topical. Is that something that you align with? Yep. Yep. So basically, it's very simple. Taking progesterone orally means more allopregnolone. Hmm. The calming, tranquilizing neurosteroid is made in the liver. And taking it transdermally or vaginally bypasses that to some extent. I mean, you still get some allopregnolone being made from the from progesterone but yeah so that's why oral it is it's just true clinically too oral progesterone is more sedating hmm. than transdermal <clears throat> or vaginal and also technically and just to align with the research oral progesterone is currently at least perceived to be effective for protecting the uterine lining from estrogen therapy whereas transdermal is perceived to be not effective for that purpose I see. but Transdermal, not to totally poo-poo, like transdermal progesterone can still, I find, still give some clinical relief from like migraines and mood and things like that. And that's a little bit in the controversy too, because progesterone creams, now we're talking about now, or transdermal progesterone is very much seen by, well, by prominent members of the medical community anyway, to be like, you know pseudoscience like not a thing like some you know there's sort of this real pushback against progesterone cream we could talk about that a little bit I think um and yet uh, as a clinician I think it does it does work like you know it's just like it depends on which research question you're asking about it right like trans progesterone creams have been tested to see if they can protect the uterine lining from estrogen therapy and they cannot at least so far, according to the research. But then that's been taken to mean, oh, therefore they don't do anything. But that doesn't mean they don't, they can still help with some symptoms. So yeah, hopefully. especially like yeah. local tissue health. and Well, and if they help with mood. They, there's no question they do. Progesterone okay. creams can help with mood. If it's less sedating than oral. But um, hmm. yeah. Interesting. But that has, I, that has been tested <laughs> to my knowledge. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to, just a little tangent. I was just thinking yeah. while you're talking that it wouldn't it be cool and ideal if you know your first book gets in the hand of a 16 year old or 14 year old that's <laughs> having some struggle with their menstrual cycles and they learn they learn about their body and they learn some tools and then they you know kind of go about their their life and then maybe some symptoms start arising in their 30s and they pick up book two. Yeah. And like, there's just like this life cycle support. Um, I don't know, it just seems like a yeah. really, yeah, one of your messages is to um, to know your body, right? Yeah. Actually, to be fair, actually, Adam, that ha- that has happened a little bit already. I've had some followers who said they read, cool. they had read my first book like five or six years ago when they were like 32 and now they're 37. It's like, oh, and your new book is right on time because yeah. I'm, yeah. 
so because just to put you know just to think about generations like millennials like some of the older millennials are in perimenopause right now <laughs> so like this is you know we think of it as this old lady thing but like it's it's not and that's one of the messages in my book is like you're most a lot of women are actually quite young relatively speaking when you start perimenopause and that's normal that's okay it's you know it doesn't mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um okay well testosterone dominance in perimenopause the first time i heard of that term was from you and then i started kind of noticing clinically you know that uh how often that arises like maybe could you um explain that because most people think about androgen dominance or you know testosterone dominance um as a feature of polycystic ovarian syndrome or something you know along those yeah. lines and so um, how does how does that scenario arise? And can you talk about some of the symptoms that might appear? Yeah. So just to, as the beginning, say that both estradiol, our main estrogen, and progesterone have antiandrogen effects. So that's ongoing. And that's actually part of, I mean, just to really zoom out, like, with with menarche like with the first we have andarchy like andro- so we have the androgens kick in in 11 like 10 11 year old girls and then of course then of course we use androgens to make estrogen eventually like so an- androgens kick in most not most like all girls go through kind of a temporary pcos state before they start menstruating but then the idea is once ovulation kicks in then they start making more and more estrogen and progesterone which then have an anti-androgen effect and kind of end that temporary pcos that would be kind of at that end and then as long as we're mens ovulating or pregnant then we're going to have lots of the beneficial anti-androgens and then with Men in the later phases of perimenopause, well, first we lose progesterone, then we lose, we lose, not entirely lose, but then we have lower estrogen. And at the same time, actually, I didn't know this, but androgens do bump up a little bit in our late 40s. So for in women anyway, so obviously, as listeners might know, androgens in both sexes de- slowly decline with age, like that's their trajectory. That's, that's true in both sexes. But then in perimenopause, we get this ever just slight bump up, not back to where it was when we were 20 or anything, but like it's just a slight rise um, from both ovaries and I think adrenal glands to some extent. And then, but the more importantly, what's happening is a relative androgen excess. So as we lose the anti-androgen effects of progesterone and estradiol, then androgens shine through. And what that means, like in clinically, is weight gain around the middle. So androgens promote insulin resistance to some extent. It depends, right? Like there have to be other risk factors for insulin resistance. But that's where the apple-shaped, that's where we get with menopause, basically. We shift from hourglass body shape to more of a male body shape. And that mm-hmm. is actually, I would argue, to, alert, to some extent, unavoidable. So I don't, I would, I have said in other interviews, like, I don't think we need to fight to maintain an hourglass. Yeah. Shape. Like you can't, like, I think hormone therapy can maybe help to some extent to do that, but it's okay to thicken a little bit around the waist, but that's right. androgens doing that. Um, and androgens increase cardiovascular risk in menopausal women. Um, there, obviously, there can be little more subtle things like a slight increase in facial hair, not dramatic. Like if there's a dramatic increase in facial hair, then that's something else. But like a slight, you know, a few hairs on the chin and yeah, basically that. So and that um, in terms of combating that in the book, I talk a little bit about the value of estrogen and progesterone therapy, but also just simple things like maintaining a healthy level of SHBG. Will your listeners know what that is or sex hormone bonding globulin? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I think they will generally speaking. And then, you know, yeah. that, that section um, of your book is really yeah. good at explaining what's happening there. Yeah. So SHBG is this protein um, we make in the liver and women make tons more of it than men. Like I think like three times more or something. And it, it obviously it binds to it's called sex hormone binding globulin it binds to estrogen yeah. and, and androgens and 
it's stimulated by estrogen. So when our estrogen goes down with menopause, hand in hand, SHBG goes down. And that also liberates more testosterone. If you have more free available testosterone because less of it's bound to SHBG, hopefully that's clear. And yeah. so another holistic strategy is to promote a healthy level of SHBG, which you can do actually with phytoestrogens yeah. and, and like, like whole foods. And that's, I think that might be where some of the benefit from phytoestrogens comes in for, especially for perimenopause, menopause. So, I mean, it's possible with SHBG, obviously there's the sweet spot, but in general with menopause, with age, with insulin resistance, with thyroid disease, all of those things result in abnormally low SHBG. So we yeah. can try to counterbalance that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I always share with my patients, male or female, you know, sort of like every decade learning what's happening with your body, Yeah. you know, or is, is really important whether you do something or about it or not, just knowing what yeah. the changes are so that you can know how to bring balance to that kind of next decade. Um, Cause yeah. you know, it's, I think that's really useful because certain, certain strategies like, um, you know, whether it's the form of exercise you partake in or the macronutrient balance you, you have as your lifestyle or phytoestrogens, like you mentioned, um, could help just bring balance so it's not as um, not as an abrupt change. Sure. Yeah. And of course, there's tons of which you've sort of started the conversation. We could continue like um, lifestyle changes to ease the transit or to basically make this transition of perimenopause or second puberty to yeah. make it as symptom free as possible. And we, yeah. could, we, could, we could go into some of that if you want. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I'd love to if we have time, but I... I I think the, you know, kind of the hormone of one of the yeah. most interesting hormones to most yeah. people is like estrogen. So okay. we, we probably spend a little time about it. And, you know, I, I think one of the lights you've shined with estrogen too, if we have time, is its connection to mast cells. Sure. And that is fascinating. Yeah. All right. So estrogen is beneficial. <laughs> estrogen is a <laughs> super hormone. It's like it's it's amazing, really. It is my favorite hormone, estradiol, I guess we're speaking about specifically. Um, men make it too, as you know, like men and kids and everybody. You actually need estradiol inside your cells, which is why we all have this mechanism of making it from androgens inside our cells. That's mostly how men, men get most of theirs. And that's how after menopause we will, if we're healthy, still have quite a lot of estradiol inside cells, just the amount that cells need. Um, the mitochondria seriously love estradiol. So it is lots going on with that hormone. Um, but in the perimenopause transition, estradiol goes higher initially up to three times higher, spiking up to three times higher, but then dropping down to, again. So it's a roller coaster on a monthly basis, but a more amplified roller coaster. And some of the symptoms of perimenopause come from the downward, down the roller coaster that estrogen withdrawal phase of the cycle, which can, that's what triggers um, hot flushes, or as we say, down under hot flushes, night sweats, potentially migraines. And then, but when estrogen is high, in some women, depending on your immune system, you can get a mast cell reaction to that. And because estradiol stimulates mast cells to release and like, and conversely, histamine stimulates the ovaries to make more mast cell or to make more uh, estrogen, sorry, histamine stimulates. Yeah. It. So you get this feed forward cycle. And so that can feel really horrible. That high estrogen, high mast cell, high histamine can feel like headaches, breast swelling, hives, irritability, insomnia. That's definitely one of the mechanisms driving some of the symptoms. And I think that colloquially, you know, when people use the term estrogen dominance to describe a set of symptoms, I think they're actually talking about this histamine mast cell reaction to estrogen yeah Est technically estrogen dominance can also mean like anovulatory cycles and not making progesterone as you probably know i don't use the term estrogen dominance because it's too vague um but so then so you get this up real ups and downs of estradiol especially in the early phases of perimenopause all affected by gut microbiome and immune system and all these things that impair you know, if estrogen clearance is impaired or if the immune system is reacting to estrogen, 
And so there are lots of ways to try to stabilize some of that. And then eventually, of course, we do proceed through the phases to a lower estrogen, more consistently lower estrogen phase, which is going to be the next 40 years, 40 years of our life. So it's not, not a small phase. Mm-hmm. And um, that is associated, estrogen doesn't drop to zero. It drops to about 10%, estradiol drops to about 10% of what we use to make, like 10% of serum levels. And then, of course, it's the estradiol making it inside our cells from androgens, which we hope is happening. And so there, that, especially initially, as, as the tissues are adapting to that and including in the brain, there is a, what I call in the book an energy crisis and because estradiol normally helps the mitochondria to burn glucose for energy. And so when they are, they can also do other things, right? Like they can burn ketones for energy. They can, they can have some metabolic flexibility, like th- there's options. And this is a little bit where the evolutionary mismatch c- comes in because I think the Hadza and our prehistoric ancestors, when they, you know, they reduced their ability to turn glucose into energy, that was not a big deal because they didn't have insulin resistance. They were eating a pretty, you know, lean diet as it was. No. They have a metabolic, they, you know, if, if you have metabolic flexibility, your cells can just be like, oh, it's fine. I'll use ketones or use glucose sure. when I have it and kind of go back and forth. But in our modern world, the drop in estradiol is associated with a shift to insulin resistance, uh, made worse if there's other risk factors for insulin resistance. And I think that's where, that's where we get this, it, the signal from the research that lower estrogen of menopause is associated with a shift to cardiovascular risk and potentially even dementia risk. So just kind of understanding that it's involved a lot about metabolism and Mm -hmm. the metabolic superpower of estrogen and being able to like compensate for that and or supplement estrogen is helpful. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's really been great the last five or so years where um, estrogen has been taken off kind of the most avoided list kind of uh, that was sort of plugged for many of years of with lots of warnings and now really presented with like more balance of sure. like all, all the health benefits of um, estrogen. And, uh, you know, I did not know that mitochondrial connection. That is fascinating. Yeah, 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 for sure. And yeah, and also just, I guess, on the topic of, of estrogen therapy, if we're kind of at that topic a little bit now, we do also understand that modern, well, especially transdermal body identical estradiol, which is what most modern menopausal hormone therapies are now, is safer. Well, it's safer than estrogen, in general, estrogen is safer than previous, than thought for, you know, a while since the women's you know, that 2001 Women's Health Initiative got some things wrong, as you probably know. And so there's that as a, re, a reframing, a relook at the evidence, but also the fact that transdermal estrogen is just safer than the old school of Premarin, old style of Premarin, oral horse estrogens. And mm-hmm. then modern hormone therapy often, not always, but often pairs it with body identical real progesterone, which is also a lot safer than progestins. That's where the biggest safety difference comes in. And so modern hormone therapy, if that's what it is, body identical estradiol and progesterone is here's just a little factoid for everyone. The, the can, the breast cancer risk associated with that kind of formula is less than moderate alcohol intake. So one Mm. drink a week, Oh, sorry, what am I saying? One drink a day, not one drink, one drink a week is quite low, but like one drink a day would be moderate between one to two drinks a day, increases the risk of breast cancer more than hormone therapy. Then, wow. the, yeah, so that's kind of puts it in a little bit in perspective. Yeah. And that, I mean, that does also touch on the fact that alcohol is really bad. <laughs> so right. Is that, yeah. 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 Really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there'd be like a whole other podcast to talk about like what to do about all this, but we've, we've highlighted a few, few things. I would just love to just kind of hear 
your general perspective of, you know, treatment um, philosophy or just how to support um, yeah. the body? Well, a lot of in the book, as you know, I talk about supporting the body through its recalibration. It's like a software update. It is a challenging time. The neurological symptoms make sense when you think about the fact that the brain is having to do things very differently. It's lost the GABA support of progesterone. It's lost losing the metabolic support of estrogen. It's had to deal with like estrogen spikes and mast cell you know, activation and like high histamine. So there's a lot going on. So I come in with what I call in the book, the basic action plan for brain rewiring, which involve like that's where I start and then I do also in the book talk about using progesterone or estrogen therapy and certain other supplements but the basic action plan for the neurological symptoms is all the obvious things like I'll just kind of run through them off the top of my head like it's it's not a long list but it's like you know rest basically like supporting the like rest and yoga and breathing and out, getting mm-hmm. outside and green exercise and circadian rhythm and everything that's under that banner of just supporting the nervous system And then I talk about identifying and reversing insulin resistance because insulin resistance is really bad for the brain, especially during this transition. And that includes building muscle. And as you know, just building muscle is really good for the brain. Moving the body is, the brain loves that. You know, there's this um, exercise and muscle stimulates what's, if I've got this right, like the BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factor. So the brain loves, the brain loves movement. Then I talk about, alcohol, like maybe quitting alcohol or dramatically reducing it for the sake of the brain, as well as like for the sake of circadian rhythm and the brain, as well as the breast cancer risk, which I just alluded to. So those are kind of my main lifestyle things. And then I come in with a couple of, well, there's other things like, you know, stabilizing your blood sugar, getting more protein. So you feel full and stabilized. And then, um, I come in with magnesium and taurine. As you know, I, my editor, my, when she was looking at the book, she's like, I think we should just put magnesium and taurine in the water supply for you know <laughs> perimenopausal women. So, well, as you know, magnesium is beneficial for everyone, not just women. It's, I think one of the main reasons magnesium is so helpful, well, it, it does lots of things, but it, as you may know, like it, it reduces glutamate since like in the brain. So it's kind of, yeah. it's calming to, it's calming to the brain and <clears throat> the mitochondria I love it. So the mitochondria yeah. are having to undergo this change. So it's it really, and most of our magnesium is inside cells, inside mitochondria, which is why you can't yeah. measure it, measure it on a blood test. I just had a patient the other day say, well, can we measure magnesium? To see, can we test it to see if I need it? It's like, absolutely not. Like you can't, <laughs> like a blood test doesn't tell you anything about yeah. your mitochondria's requirement for magnesium. Yeah. And both of those nutrients are so important in detoxification too. True. That's true. Yeah. And uh, that's, yeah. that's the thing about holistic medicine. You know, it's like if you have one therapy that does multiple things that are beneficial, that's by definition holistic. Yep, for sure. So um, I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I think no, you were gonna... no, that's it. I think that was my basic action plan for brain rewiring. And then, of course, like just troubleshooting. There's lots of different treatments for different things and there's a whole section on hormone therapy which i'm in general pretty supportive of women using hormone therapy especially if they need it but i would also make the argument that not everyone needs it and i think if if women are healthy and fine and symptom free and don't have insulin resistance and don't you know be showing risk signs of um, disease and don't have risk factors for osteoporosis then i think i don't think they should be made to feel like they have to take estrogen like I feel like actually the pendulum has swung it keeps swinging back and forth like when I started in practice in the 90s the narrative was take estrogen to protect your heart and that was very strong it was kind of like if you don't take it you're being stupid and then of course the women's health initiative study came and then everyone rushed off estrogen but now we're starting to get this message back again it's like if you don't take it you're being stupid which is like I don't like that either I think it it's more beneficial for some women compared to others. And a lot of it, I would, if you, if I was going to really pare it down and this is oversimplified, but I think estrogen therapy is most beneficial both in terms of symptoms and 
long-term reduction of disease risk. It's most beneficial for women with impaired metabolism or insulin Mm -hmm. resistance because it helps to mitigate that or compensate for that. Women with a healthy Mm -hmm. metabolic flexibility, you know, healthy in all ways, I, I, I be, I don't think they need estrogen. So I think it's, it varies. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That is really great to know. Um, Yeah. It's very helpful. Um, so, this has been amazing. I, I just always learn so much from you and it's our third time doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Each podcast is just like mind blowing to me. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, is welcome. there any uh, closing thoughts that um, you'd like to share with us? Or I, I know your book is available all over the place, um, but maybe just kind yeah. of share some, about your website. Your website yeah. is just chock full of information. Yeah. I'm easy to find. So my website is my blog is Lara Bryden. Dot com. All of my social media is at Lara Bryden. And I usually, I just try to share health information on Instagram. That's my main approach with my social media. Yeah. So, and my books are period repair manual and hormone repair manual. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah. I, I, I really enjoy following your journey and, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be more to learn in the years yeah. to come. Yeah. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. Please share these episodes with your friends, loved ones, colleagues, patients, healthcare providers, anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if these the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit from that. For the the episode to them and i'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them so once again we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the one thing podcast and again much appreciation for you being here with me